So today we're going to talk about something called fecal microbiota transplantation. Now, why would anyone give a crap about this topic? I'm sorry, I had to do that. But this fecal transplantation is becoming mainstream in medicine. It's highly effective for the infection called C. diff. It can greatly help irritable bowel diseases. It's been found to be superior to antibiotics. There's been great results with autism, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, decreasing risks of cancer, Parkinson's, chronic fatigue syndrome, acne, and even depression. However, I have some basic questions about this therapy. How long does it really last? I mean, if you go back to your usual eating habits, do you maintain this microbiome or does it become altered or affected by your lifestyle? I mean, what people really should be doing is find out what the fecal donor is eating and eat like that person. But uh, this fecal transplant has been around for a very, very long time. I'm talking like 2000 years. The Chinese actually used it as a therapy for many different things. But there's some really important points to this topic. The fact that it works so well for so many different conditions. I mean, the connection between our microbes and both the innate and the acquired immune system, the importance in brain health, the importance of digesting things that we can't digest, like fiber, the importance of these secondary bile salts made by microbes, and the importance of bile in general. Also for our skin and autoimmune diseases, nearly every single autoimmune disease starts in your gut. And if there was a much better friendly relationship with these microbes, chances are you probably wouldn't get an autoimmune problem. I mean, there are certain um, bacteria that help reduce the risk for kidney stones because these microbes help to deal with oxalates. There's microbes that deal with uric acid to help reduce the risk of gout. There are microbes that produce compounds that are anti-cancer. And really, we just need to change our overall viewpoint with these bacteria or microbes in general. We've been attacking the germ as it's the sole cause of infection. But we're finding out more and more that uh, that's not the cause of infection. It's our immune system. It's the environment. And the more that we sterilize our environments, our food, our gut, the more we're going to need this therapy. So let's talk about what not to do and what to do. Okay. You want to limit your exposure to drugs, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, especially the one in GMO foods called glyphosate, which has been patented as an antibiotic. Uh, we want to limit the exposure to antibiotics and consuming animals that have been given antibiotics. We really want to start avoiding foods that have been sterilized. You know, you pasteurize all these foods like the milk products, the canned products like soups, the juices. We even use radiation to sterilize our foods, which is crazy. Instead, you should have a good portion of your diet raw. Okay. I'm talking about raw vegetables. I'm not talking about raw chicken, okay? But maybe you can have like beef that's rare. That would be better. But the more you cook the food, the more you pasteurize things, the more you kill off good bacteria. Now, what's so special about plants? Yes, they give us the fiber that the microbes will live on. But I don't know if you knew this, but plants are filled with microbes. That's right. You're consuming microbes when you're eating a raw plant. Of course, it really depends on where that plant is grown. If it's uh, grown maybe aeroponically or something like that, it probably doesn't have as many microbes. But if it's grown on really good soils, chances are it's going to be filled with microbes and that can actually help you. One video I did talked about uh, a really interesting topic on how plants really get their nutrition. And they get the nutrition by eating bacteria. That's right. The majority of nutrition that a plant gets is by eating bacteria. So the roots eat the microbe and, and then extract the nutrients from it and then spit the microbe back out and it starts to recycle. A lot of these microbes travel up to the stem and to the leaf where they help that plant. And so this opens up a whole new area to look at in growing food and in farming and uh, I'm actually setting up several experiments on this topic very soon, and I'm going to share that on a new YouTube channel. So stay tuned for more information about that. I found two labs that can help identify the microbes in plants, and so we're going to do all sorts of tests. 
Now, these plants also have certain phytonutrients that go beyond just acting as a prebiotic. They can actually help balance the bad bacteria. For example, sulforaphane and broccoli sprouts and other cruciferous vegetables can help inhibit and destroy H. pylori, that microbe that's behind ulcers, gastritis, and even certain types of uh, GERD. You get a lot of cool effects from eating plants. Certain flavonoids are antimicrobial. Quercetin has been shown to inhibit uh, E. coli. And uh, another pigment found in plants called anthoxanthin has been known to inhibit salmonella. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, wait a second. I thought that plants were filled with anti-nutrients and we shouldn't be eating plants. We should all be doing carnivore. Well, if you have certain digestive problems where you can't digest plant food, well, then maybe you should. But I'm not recommending that you eat all plants, just a portion of your diet. And probably the biggest anti-nutrient that can affect people is oxalates, right? But that's really easy to solve if you just avoid the plants that are high in oxalates, like you'd want to avoid the spinach, the beet green, the Swiss chard. Also avoid like nuts, kiwi, and of course, potato. And if you're on the ketogenic diet, you don't have to worry about that. Chocolate is another thing that is very high in oxalates that you should avoid. And of course, beans and grains are just loaded with oxalates, and especially quinoa, which is supposed to be like a healthy grain. So the point is that just because uh, plants have anti-nutrients doesn't mean we should just completely avoid all of them. If you have gastritis, for example, I found cabbage, which also is pretty high in sulforaphane, can be good for that condition. In fact, it's probably one of the only vegetables that I found that you could actually digest without discomfort. So to increase the diversity of your microbes in your gut, you want to increase a wide range of plant foods. Of course, not the ones I just mentioned, instead of just having like one type of vegetable all the time. You also want to eat fermented products, pickles and sauerkraut and kimchi, which are all microbial enhanced. You can also do raw milk cheese or kefir, which are loaded with microbes. Another way to increase the uh, diversity of microbes is to try to reduce your stress as much as possible because stress actually really affects the microbes in the gut, which is interesting. Fasting, okay, regular intermittent fasting and periodic prolonged fasting also increases the diversity and the health of your gut. And exercise can even help the microbiome. So it's all about uh, creating an environment where these microbes can thrive. When you change the environment and you stress it out, as in someone taking an antibiotic, boy, you create all sorts of, shall I say, like a shift of relationship with those microbes. So before they were friendly, now they're unfriendly. And this happens in the soil as well. If you, for example, start killing off certain things in the soil, uh, sometimes you'll have an increase in uh, fungus, right? And see, in nature, fungus actually, as one of their foods, they eat bacteria. And if there's not enough food for them, uh, they start going after the plant and start uh, creating plant infections because their environment is not good. There's just not enough food. Well, the exact same thing happens in our guts as well. When you take an antibiotic, you pretty much stress the fungus, and I'm talking about candida, and then that starts to affect you. It starts creating an unfriendly relationship where it negatively affects you. Whereas before, it's like in a symbiotic a relationship that doesn't affect you. Uh, we normally have candida in our system, and candida normally doesn't affect us until we change that relationship by changing the environment. If you are female and you're going to have a baby, I would highly recommend that you breastfeed because the first breast milk is called colostrum. And in that colostrum, you have the mother's immunity. You're giving that baby friendly bacteria that's going to go in the digestive system and start to seed it. And the same principle occurs with plants. Um, a seed is not just something that has genetics that grow into a plant. A seed is really like Noah's Ark. It's filled with all sorts of microbes inside and outside. And if you really understand that concept, you know, that could change your um, method of handling seeds and how maybe you should inoculate the seed and add some 
microbes to the seed to help it to grow better. A lot of people should be taking probiotics on a regular basis, especially if they take antibiotics at the same time. So I've covered a lot of different areas to this topic, but I think it's a really important topic to have it sink into your brain. And there's a lot more to talk about with the digestive system. There's a really important video that I did that I'm going to put up right here. And if you haven't seen it, you should check it out.